exactly. Today is the 13th of Cheshvan, the 14th of November. We're at the, towards the end of chapter 28, page 260. And so we've established that even when you're talking about uh, the world of emanation, talking about a dilug, a, a, a skip, a quantum leap, and same thing as by Ankh, same thing as by everything. And the important thing here is that the, what we talked about yesterday is that the world of emanation is predicated on two things that the Arizal was mechadesh, is two innovations, Tzimtzum ve'al Basha. I think that was actually two days ago. Uh, contraction and enclosement. Um, <laughs> these, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm subscribed to too many news services. So, the, so this morning when I woke up, I see, uh, I can't remember who it was, maybe the Times or the Telegraph, I don't remember who it was. They wrote that Trump uh, pledged to reveal the truth about UFOs uh, soon after he goes into <laughs> office. And he knows that the American people can handle it. Okay, whatever. <laughs> the truth is nobody knows. <laughs> that's the, that's the, tr- the true truth. Nobody knows. Um, there are phenomena that just can't belie- be explained. And uh, there's no contact with this phenomenon. I once told uh, Yaakov... Uh, because it, I think it's interesting in terms of in terms of how history progresses and how the human mind progresses and so on. That um, I, I can't remember what the uh, example was before. There was an example before, but I don't remember right now. Um, we said that there are three types of relationship between Hashem and the world, or between things in general. We call them ishtal shelut, itlapshut hashra. Ishtal shelut. Cause and effect is basically what we call mechanics. It's physics that are mechanics, and, and that was that was yeah, quite sure. clear, and, and so on. And oh, okay, so now I remember. And then we move to a new stage. We move to a new stage around 1840, something like that. The industrial Revolution. Well, the industrial revolution. We usually say the first revolution was 1760. Oh, 1840 okay. is already the second. Oh, second. Okay. okay. But. The, the big change was that they moved from steam to electricity. That was uh, uh, as of about 1840. And it still took another uh, 20, 25 years for Maxwell to figure out how in the world to quantize, quantify uh, this new phenomena that we know and we use, but we have no understanding of. We truly have no understanding of it. I, I say this with, <laughs> with regret, but it's true. Um, it's called electricity. We don't know what electricity really is. We have all kinds of theories. And uh, Maxwell was able to quantify a phenomenon that we don't know how to fully explain. And that's a great achievement of mathematics. That You would think that maybe mathematics wouldn't work unless you fully understood the topic. But for some reason, this language works even if you don't fully understand what you're talking about. So he, there's Maxwell's four equations. I remember when I was uh, in, in college, we had this I already had this t-shirt, I think. It said, and God said, and then it had Maxwell's four equations of electromagnetics, and there was light, because light is an electromagnetic phenomenon. <laughs> so before, before there was a, you could say, a quantification, a, a, a conquering of this field of, of electronics, of electricity, uh, electromagnetic phenomenon, um, there were a lot of hints to it. There were many, many um, phenomena over history that were documented, but nobody connected to uh. electromagnetic phenomena. They didn't understand that this is what it was going on. And it took, it took the 1850s and 60s to really bring it all together and to show that a very wide range of phenomena, like you wouldn't think that light is electromagnetic, but it is. Um, so th- there's all these things that, that um, um, had, had to happen mathematically for us to bring a coherent picture to many phenomena. Not to under understanding. Our understanding didn't get any better. Or at least not, m- not essentially better. But, but it got better that we know how to use it. But before that, they didn't even see the connection between these phenomena. Radiation, nobody thought radiation, black body radiation. And everything that Einstein did in the beginning... All this is electromagnetic phenomenon. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the famous uh, you know, the electrostatic uh, equation. I can't remember what it's called. That Einstein did also the uh, Brownian motion. 
all these things, nobody realizes it's all the same thing. Now, and we say in Hasidus that electromagnetism is the best example in the end, a phenomenon that we know of hitlabshut, uh, of enclothement. It's the very best example of it. And there's a lot to say about that, we're not going to get into that. But there's still one more branch of, of relationship that we don't know so much about, which is called ashra, and again, we call it immersion, or what it means really is that something is universal, it's everywhere. What does that mean? Hashem is everywhere. We say He's omnipresent. That's hashra. That's saying that Hashem is hashra. He's, he's everywhere you look. He's everywhere the same. Wherever you look, up, down, wherever. So we're getting hints of this now. And we're seeing that all kinds of phenomena that were discounted in the past are beginning to be taken seriously and being studied, trying to be studied. But it's not a very uh, deep field the yet. Natural phenomena. Right, right, they're natural. They're, they're, they're completely natural. We, don't, we just don't know what they, they are. So the, the human mind, when it doesn't know what to do with something, it says it's an alien. Like, it, it, if I can't give you a name, if I can't place it, if I can't recognize it, so it must be something extraterrestrial. It's very hard for the human mind to accept that this is very terrestrial. <laughs> this has nothing to do with anything coming from outer space. This is just a part of nature that we don't yet understand. And for a long time I was looking for what, what in the world this could be, because I, I had a hint, all kinds of hints, that this is related to Hashra. These are phenomena, just like electricity changed our lives, this new type of phenomenon is going to change our lives even more. And this is the Hashra equivalent, the physical Hashra equivalent of what we mean that Hashem will be felt everywhere, will transform the world much more than electricity did. But it's an equivalent, in the same way that Hashem's revelation will transform the world morally, spiritually, and all that, then the equivalent in the physical world will also transform the world in ways that we can't understand. And, and the question is, what in the world is the candidate for going in that direction? So there is a candidate, and it, it gets seri more serious as you look at it. And it's called zero-point energy. Zero. Zero point energy. I don't know why they chose this name. I don't understand why. It sounds like it's science fiction, but it's not. It's a very serious field in physics. Um, Einstein studied it. He was one of the first ones to study it. And it comes out of the equations, and it's serious math. And what it claims is, is that in any point of reality, you can find infinite energy. And so you don't have to look for alien, um, what do you call it, uh, Hana. You don't have to look for, um, for alien engines of something traveling. This could be a very natural phenomenon that until now, you just simply couldn't see it because there were no planes that you could even document this with. There was no radar. There was no, there was no way to even get a glimpse of it. So maybe there were some very ancient docu documents about it, uh, eyewitnesses, but no, nobody paid any attention to it because they couldn't even know, they didn't even know what to do with electricity yet. And electricity is pretty common in the world. Static electricity is everywhere. Lightning is, Lightning uh, is everywhere. Is, yeah. And they still didn't know what to do with it. Amber is everywhere. Uh, there's radiation everywhere. They still didn't know. Because the mind can't wrap its head around it. It right, takes time. So, but most of us, gravity also, we don't really know. Right, right. We don't know one can describe it. Gravity. Right, it took... Gravity, a, yes. it, it took yes, all yes, the yes, yes, Right, but that... Yes, yes, what yes, 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 yes. But that Newton covered with me mechanics, as it were. And he also said in his uh, Principia, I leave it to the future generations to explain what in the world this force is. He didn't know what it was. It's called an occult force because you don't... An occult force? Yeah, that's what they call it. Electricity is still... Still, still called an occult? Occult force because we don't know what it is. Uh, is the, the most important... Yes, of course. To some extent, yes. To some extent, no. Because we already know that there are gravitons. We already know the, the, uh, the uh, particle that transfers this force. We've seen gravity waves, which is a very big chiddush. In 2006, I think, it was finally 100% demonstrated there are gravity waves, which was uh, something that Einstein uh, hypothesized. You didn't know for sure. So all these forces, we don't know them exactly. Now, now here is a force that is, is a question. I can't tell you. I don't know enough math to be able to follow their articles <laughs> that, th that were published but I think that it is a derivative, it is connected somehow to electromagnetics but I'm not sure it could be that it's a weak force or a strong force something else is causing it 
But there are these phenomena, there are natural phenomena that the human mind cannot wrap its head around yet. And when it does, you suddenly say, ah, well, why did I have to go so far? Why did we go so far? But that's, that's how the human mind works. When I don't understand something, I have to relegate it off into space. It came from outer space. It's not from outer space, it's something in... Uh, now, why do I say this? Because this is where Hasidus is. Hasidus is constantly talking about this zero-point gravity, whether, uh, energy, whether you like it or not. It's saying Hashem is everywhere. Hashem yeah, is here, Hashem is, is there, Hashem... Yes. Hasidus is all about Hashra in the end. Is it able to fully explain it, not able to fully explain it? Those are questions that we still need to answer. But here's a text in, uh, from the 150 years ago that for sure was very well aware of the fact that there are phenomena that we don't yet uh, appreciate, we don't yet know. And the way that he knows this is because he says, in Torah there is this phenomenon. <laughs> it exists. There is this thing of Hashem being everywhere, of oh. the infinite being everywhere. And that's called Ashra. So that's just to fill in this uh, Itlab Shut. Everywhere but concealed, is that what you're saying? Right, it's yes. concealed to us yeah. right now. That's why right, we call it, right, right. uh, that it's still yes. hidden. Yes. Um, the Shechina appears in many ways. The Shechina can appear as cause and effect, it can appear as enclosement, and it can also appear as this type of immersion, total immersion or, 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 or uh, universality, or however you call it. Because one myth of the I think the real UFO you started, he's Trump himself. <laughs> where did he come Trump from? Himself where did he UFO. come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why he says, I'll tell you where, <laughs> I'll tell you where I came from. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? This is a clock, may I tell Relatively, relatively, you're here. Yeah, that's quantum mechanics. You're probably, you're probably here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We come to the gabei. So this we read. Alderch mashal. We said. So the gabei. The vow she bli gvul mamash avin achat im alfe alafim k'mo shkatu b'mekom achel. So we were talking about the infinite. And of course, and we have the example of Andromeda and a star in Andromeda and a, and a, and a planet circling. So compared to interstellar space that is insignificant, everything becomes the same. So even in emanation, when we're talking about wisdom of emanation, we have to say that it is a creation, something from nothing as it were, again, because it, there is no commensur- commensurability to its origin. And what the Alter Rebbe said in this addendum to the Tanya, that after Hashem is already enclosed in the infinite uh, vessels of, 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 of the vessels of Chabad, of uh, wisdom, under, understanding, and knowledge of the world of emanation, then you can say that God is the knower because now He's already enclosed Himself in intellectual prowess. And then what he meant to say is, then, then about the Chochma Bina and Das, the Chochma would be the knower, the Bina would be the power of knowing, and the Dat would be what is known. So these three are like one entirely. You have to treat them like they're one thing entirely because the infinite revelation of Hashem is now enclosed within them. And that makes it one. <coughs> And again, the, 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 the whole point here is that the Rambam treated Hashem like his intellect. That was the whole issue. So he says, yes, it's true. After Hashem takes the infinity and he encloses it within, he invests it within the intellectual faculties of the world of emanation. Now we have a problem, and that's what the Rambam said, that this seems to be a contradiction. Not a, just a contradiction, but a paradox. Tarte de Satre is the, um, is the, uh, uh, the, the Talmud's way of saying a paradox. These two things, they contradict one another. That's a simple meaning. But here, he's not just saying they contradict, and you have to choose one. He's saying they contradict, and they're both right. On the one hand, the Shem is infinitely different than the intellect, on the other hand, he encloses himself within the intellect, and suddenly the intellect becomes all one, like it's Hashem. And 
So he says, really, the whole issue of what does it mean even that the infinite of Hashem comes down into something finite, that itself is already a problem for the human mind to understand. We can't fully understand it. And this is the secret of faith, Amuna, as it says in the Zohar, the Zohar calls it the Raza de Memnuta. Anytime you see in the Zohar Raza de Memnuta, you know he's going to say some kind of deep insight into what it <coughs> means that we have faith. Now this is very fitting, and that's why I brought these pages, we won't get them to them until tomorrow, um, to the Parsha this week, because we're dealing, every single, every single incidence in Avram's life is an incidence of what is faith, what is Amuna? Because he's Av Lekola Ma'aminim, he's the, the head and the father of all those who have faith. So what does it mean to have faith? So to have faith changes from generation to generation. In Avram's, but, but, the, but the principles are the same. It's always what's beyond what the mind can understand right now. The faith is always tapping into what the mind cannot yet understand. So what we'll do tomorrow, God willing, is we'll look at the Hasidic interpretation of the Akedah, because tomorrow is the day of the Akedah that we read in the Chitas, uh, the Akedah. What was the Akedah? What was the binding of Isaac? Why was it considered to be a test of Abraham's faith? These are all tests of his faith. So why was it? What, why was it, what was it the test of his faith? We'll read it from Priya Aritz from the Men- Mendel Vitebsk, who the Rebbe many times said he doesn't know why he's not a Rebbe in the uh, in, in the chain of uh, Rebbe's in Chabad because he was the Alter Rebbe's Rebbe for many many years, and the Tanya is based on what he wrote, and so we'll see. Why isn't he included? Yeah, he should be included. In any case, he's not included, but we'll read what he has to say. Um, and in Epistle 20 in the Tanya, he deals with this topic of how can it be that Hashem is one, the end self, the infinite is one with it, the vessels. And there he said that it has a practical meaning. It's n- he doesn't want to deal with the philosophical question. He gives it a practical meaning. He says that the vessels of the world of emanation have the power to create something from nothing just like the Ein Sof, just like uh, the infinite revelation of Hashem has the ability to, to, to create a skip, a quantum leap. So in the world of emanation, there's this power. Where do we see it? We see it in ourselves. That's why we say, this is the first, let's go back to the first uh, mitzvah here, Priya to be fruitful and multiply. When a person creates another person, there's a skip. How, how is it possible that I gave my child the power of the infinite to... In, in many, many respects, and th- that we'll get into when we start from the beginning again. Uh, we, we never study this uh, mitzvah, the first mitzvah. So that's what he says in Epistle 20. So he tries to stay away from, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the philosophical questions. Don't think that there are only cause and effect. But here we want to deal with the philosophical question, he says. We're not going to leave it at that. And what he said in Pistol 20. And so Be'ezrat Hashem, we'll start that next week, chapter 29. And tomorrow we will uh, do this. Uh, if you want to, you can take it now. Uh, if you, uh, I also did a chat GPT quick translate. Parashat Veira. We can take it if you want. And, uh, just bring it tomorrow. If you have a book, you can put in a book. Uh, it'll show up. So Be'ezrat Hashem, we'll continue with this tomorrow.